Okay, on your market set call. Okay. Um, so you know what we're going to talk about, right? Yes. More or less. What is this? Is this a yes or a no? Sort of. Okay, so we're going to talk about the essay and the college admissions process. Um, and uh, you heard there's an essay, right? You know there's an essay that you have to write at some point. How many of you have seen the common application? You actually like looked at it? Some of you. How, do any of you... Do you all know the common application exists? I say common application, you know what I'm talking about. Do any of you not know what I'm talking about? I say common application, you were like, what on earth is that? He really likes people to respond. Yeah, you have to if like... If you don't respond, he will be very successful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot worse. Um, yeah, okay. So you know what the common application is. The common application asks you to write an essay. Lots of other schools will ask you to write an essay. This is the thing you have to do. It's really important. You've heard about it. You're here to listen to me talk about it. You know, here you are six months before you even have to submit it, listening to someone present about the essay because it is so important, right? And uh, and actually, the the reason it's so important is because it's the only thing you actually control. Your grades are what they are. You don't get to rewind time and retake a trigonometry test. <laughs> rewind time to earlier today and retake a trigonometry test. You, um, you can pick which teachers write your recommendations, but you will not get to write the recommendations on their behalf. You know, you can take the SATs a second or third or fourth or fifth or God forbid more than that. Like, but at a certain point, like the score is what it is, and in the moments before you hit submit, you can't change it. Your essay is the only thing you have to send to me that is mutable, that you can alter, that is entirely under your control. And that if 30 seconds before you hit submit on the application, you decide I want to erase it and start the whole thing over again and write it from scratch, you can. And so the reason we're going to talk about the essay is because I mean, it is a really important piece of your application, but it's, in fact, the only thing you actually have power over. And we use it, and it's important, and it impacts on your decision, and so that's where we're going to focus our energy. So I'm Daniel, hello, it's nice to meet you. I work at um, Tufts University, which is a school near Boston. It's beautiful, and we have, you know, classes and stuff, and, like, things for you to do, and, oh, look how nice we are. Hey, Boston, Massachusetts, and Tufts. You should apply there, and then you should go, because you love us. Yay! <laughs> Upside down. Yeah. We look like this in the fall. This is the time of the year when leaves fall trees. Um, uh, and I read the applications for Thailand. So if you apply to Tufts next year, it will actually, literally, physically be me who's sitting down at a computer reading your application. <laughs> Nice to meet you in person. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and what I want to do to start is, I actually want to take some time before I start talking to you about things that you shouldn't do in your essays and things you should do, I, I want to back up a little bit. I want to talk about how our admissions process works and what the goals are. Because I think you're smart enough to figure out what you should be doing if you know what we're doing with your file. Right? Like if you know how we use your essay and where it fits in, I think you can figure out a lot of things on your own. And you don't need me as much. But I also know that for the most part, the admissions process is a black box where your application gets put in at one end and then a decision comes out at the other. And you have no idea what the Rube Goldberg machine is on the inside that produces the results. And I'd like to kind of open the box a little bit and let you peek inside. And, and I'll start by talking about what we do. And the first thing that I do when we receive your application, you, know, you hit submit on your computer and it travels through the tubes of the internet and goes up into Manila. Because do you know that all the web traffic from Thailand basically gets routed to the United States through Manila? <laughs> it's true. Um, so, fun fact, right? Although, did you ever notice that fun facts are never, are like never actually fun? <laughs> like somebody says, fun fact. It's almost for sure that what they're about to say is not a fun. Um, so your, your application goes to Manila, it stops in Manila briefly, and then it comes to my office in Boston, Massachusetts, where my school is located, the beautiful campus of Tufts University, which you may have heard of. It's an amazing school. Um, and what I'll do with your application, what every admissions officer will do at every school will do with your application, first is an academic review. First we look at your rigor, how hard are the classes you have chosen to take, given what's available to you here at ISB. Then we look at your grades. How successful have you been in those classes? And then we look at your standardized testing. And of course, not every school has standardized testing they require, but most of us do. And those of us that have standardized testing will look at that after we look at your rigor and your grades. Based on those three pieces, you get assigned some kind of academic rating. 
At Tufts, the scale is one to seven. At some scale, at some schools, it's seven to one. At some schools, it's out of ten or out of a hundred or out of twenty-five. Whatever, it doesn't matter. There's a scale you get put on. And for the students who make the cut academically, which is ninety percent of our applicant pool that makes the cut academically, someone like me will then read everything else. We'll look at your extracurricular list. We'll look at your interview if you've done it. We'll look at your recommendations, and we look, especially, at your essays. And I sit there. Uh, I sit there at my laptop after having read your application, and I will write about your app. I will write about your essays and your recommendations in my massive Dell, like 17 foot long laptop. It's huge and like shouldn't be used for anything other than like hang gliding, and it weighs like 25 pounds, and I hate it. Um, and I actually got a MacBook Air just so I wouldn't have to travel with it anymore because it's a monstrous machine. And, um, and I sit there at my Dell, and I have to write about a paragraph about your file. Everything you submit gets boiled down into a paragraph. Which <laughs> you got to, you got to see that. Um, and that paragraph, some of that paragraph is what did you write about? What did your teacher say about you? It's fact, it's summary. What was in your application? And the other part of that paragraph is opinion. Did I like it and why? Did I find you interesting and why? Do, like, do I think other people are going to find you interesting? And why? And actually, that last one is more important than if I find you interesting. Because I can think you're boring, but if I think other people are going to be totally fascinated by you, that's okay. Most of the time that doesn't happen. But sometimes it does, and I think, like, not my thing, but someone else's thing. We didn't care. <laughs> and that editorial, that paragraph, you know, it's like part fact, part opinion, that's an editorial, right? Half of fact, half opinion, make an argument. And that editorial is your case. It's your argument to get admitted. What happens is, I take that and I go to my committee, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So the seven of us are now the voting committee at Tufts. And what will happen is all the applications from Thailand will come up together. And I will read each of those files out, that, that one paragraph summary out, one at a time for each of the files. And after every one I read, we have a small discussion and then we vote. And sometimes that discussion is super fast, you know? I read the editorial out and the discussion is, oh my god, yes? <laughs> and we all go, yes, raise your hands. And you get in. Yeah, you got into college. Woo! It's so exciting. And, uh, and you know, you get an admit letter and you have yourself a party, unless your best friend also applied and didn't get into that school, and then you let you do something quieter so that you're like, not going to friend. <laughs> right? But like, that's good. You know, that's exciting. You know, I, I read that out and they think, oh my god, that is the coolest, most interesting thing. You get in. But if I read the paragraph out and there's a mixed reaction, you know, let's say three of them vote yes. Yes, that's four, uh, two, <laughs> three, there you go, you got it. Three of you vote yes, right? And uh, <laughs> you did not get in. Because <laughs> it's three of four, it's three of, you know, three of seven, right? You needed, you needed four votes. You know? And maybe you got three votes because I finished reading, and the three of them thought, that was cool, and the other four thought, I've heard that before. Maybe I'm reading your application out, and you get no votes. I finished reading your application out, and everyone in the room goes, eh. <laughs> Or they stare back at me with no reaction at all, just blank stares, because I finish reading and they don't care. Which happens sometimes. I mean, you know, ideally that's not you, but that does happen. You know, where you get, you get to write a response paper for an article like your English teacher gives you or something, and you sit down to write the response paper and you realize that you cannot write it because you don't care and have no response. You know what I'm talking about? Not these children. Not these children. <laughs> but maybe you guys a little bit. Not, not you, but really, just, you know. Um, and that happens, right, where I finish reading, and they have no reaction, because they don't care, because there wasn't anything interesting to react to. And that's bad, because you didn't get in. <laughs> and so your goal in the admissions process, right, like the purpose of your essay, the purpose of your application, is to make someone like me love you enough that you get in. You want me to love you. I mean, like, literally, if you apply to thoughts, you want me to love you, if that's the goal. <laughs> Let's say we get three. Let's do three votes again. Three votes. Three of seven. 
Well, I'm going to be one of them, right? So only, no, 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 only two of you need to raise your hand with me. So two of you go, one, two, one, two, yeah, you go. So now we have three votes, and now I love you so much. I love your application so much that I finished reading, and even though you only have three of seven votes right now, I start yelling at the four of them. Were you listening? Did you not hear what this person was saying? It's the coolest thing. Like, this from Thailand is crazy weird. Get on board. <laughs> One of them raises their hand, oh, four votes, and you got in. Which is actually what happens. This is actually how people get into colleges like mine. I finish reading your application, and you have uh, some votes and not enough votes, and I convince a bunch of other people to get on board, or someone else convinces me. What's my goal? So your goal is to instill that kind of love such that you have that kind of advocacy because at Tufts the admit rate was 18% this year, which means four out of every five students were getting denied. If you got in, it's because someone on the inside fought for you. So what's my goal? I'm reading the applications from Asia and Maryland. Those are the two places I'm responsible for. <laughs> so Baltimore and Bangkok. And every time I open a file, what am I trying to do? And my goal every time my goal is to love you. I want so badly, in the least creepy way I possibly can. <laughs> I want to feel the love. <laughs> and you have to know that it's not just me and Tufts, right? It's admissions officers everywhere. We're going into your applications trying to fight for you, trying to build the case that gets you in, which I know is a little counterintuitive, right? Because if I just said we were denying four of every five students that apply, and which sounds like the goal has to be to deny, right? Like I should be sitting there, sitting there with a red pen, waiting for you to make some trifling, insignificant, petty punctuation mark error so I can scratch you off the list and move on. Oh, comma, no, 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 that should have been a semicolon. <laughs> you're done here. <laughs> oh, interesting, you're talking about the debt crisis. That's fascinating, but we've all moved on to talking about gender equity in the world. You should keep up. If your last name is a ridiculously long string of letters, <laughs> it has far too many vowels in it, I'm never going to be able to pronounce it properly, I'm going to save myself the awkwardness of when we meet and just deny you now. <laughs> Can you imagine who we're left with if that's how we're doing things? Oh, you didn't write about the right idea. Denied. Oh, you made a small mistake here. Denied. Your teachers didn't talk about this. Denied. You didn't have enough hours of community service. Denied. Like, imagine if that's what we're doing. Who on earth is left? And the people that are left are the people who did everything right just by the virtue of doing nothing wrong. The people who played it safe, who didn't take risks, who didn't take chances, who didn't challenge me, who didn't challenge the application, who didn't present ideas, the people who played it safe and held back and went in conservative because they figured, if I do nothing wrong, I'm going to get in. And I don't know what kind of college or university setting you were looking for, but when I think about the kinds of places I want to be, I am not thinking of a community of people who are terrified of errors, who are scared to make mistakes, who don't take risks. That's not who I'm thinking of when I think of the people I want to be in school with, or the people I want to admit to my school. The reason I go into your applications trying to love you, trying to build the best possible case I can to admit you, is not because it makes me feel warm and fuzzy on the inside, although sometimes it actually does. Um, I go into your applications trying to build the case for you, even if I can't. My goal is still to build it. Because if I don't, we're admitting the wrong students. We're missing the cool, interesting people in favor of the people who are bland. And what I'm trying to do in my, my job, like what my office is trying to do, is to build this very deliberate, intentional community of people who have amazing ability as individuals, but people who will learn from the people around them, who will rise to greater heights, who will come up with interesting ideas that challenge their peers, and whose peers will come up with interesting ideas that challenge them. You know, this idea of diversity, which I'm sure an endless number of schools have come in and talked to you about diversity, and they've international their campuses, X percentage are from here, X percentage are from there. Oh, we're so diverse, right? And it's really easy to go diversity and to tick off a list of forms. You know, X number of nationalities, um, you know, X number of majors, uh, students from X number of states in the United States, you know, X percentage international, X students of color, right? And it's just look, notch down the list. Much more complicated and much more difficult is intellectual diversity. How do you build a group of people who think differently? And those things are all tied to your nationality and your religion and your ethnicity and your socioeconomic status and your sexual orientation and where you live, but they're not the same thing. Whether you are inductive or deductive, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, a cynic or an idealist, whether you're logical or creative, I do not learn those things by looking at your grades. You cannot hand me your transcript and have me look at it and go, oh, 
What a cynical person you are. <laughs> but we want cynics. You can't have a community filled with idealistic people who believe everything is possible. Because if everyone believes that everyone can do everything, we're all destined for failure. <laughs> but you also don't want a community of people who all believe that we're destined for failure. You need a balance of people who think anything can happen, and you need other people who think, yeah, but we have to be careful. And you know this, like you know and understand the value of diversity and the value of different ways of thinking and the ways in which diversity can be tied both intellectual to practical diversity and not because you live and, and go to school in a community like this. But your essays are the most important space for you to tell me those things about you. And I want to talk a little bit about things that students do commonly well and other things that students do commonly not well and I want to start with the not well and then move into the well. And I'm going to demonstrate for you um, two particular essay topics that pose distinctive challenges and why you should be very careful to avoid these mistakes. I am not describing these topics to tell you not to write these essays. I want to be really clear about that. You can write an effective essay about literally anything, including these topics. You're on board. But you just don't want to make these mistakes if you choose to write these essays. The first essay I want to describe are essays about grandparents. You've probably heard this before, whatever. Um, how many of you like love your grandparent? You got the best grandparent in the world. No one's grandparent is going to be better than yours. Hello, what's your name? Uh, Leanne. Leanne. Yeah. So Leanne, um, you're thinking about your grandmother or grandfather? Grandpa. Grandpa. Okay. Leanne, you and I are going to play a game. This game is called Who Has the Better Grandfather. <laughs> okay. You didn't know you were volunteering for this. <laughs> Leanne, I'm going to tell you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my grandfather. When I'm done, I want you to tell me whether you think your grandfather is better than mine. <laughs> you can make an argument, you can say, here's why, or you can just say yes or no. I prefer if you say no, but you don't have to. <laughs> All right, you ready? You actually don't look totally ready, but we're going to start anyway. <laughs> you're good, you're good, right? Okay, Leanne, my grandfather um, graduated from the University of Chicago at the age of 18 with a degree in agricultural economics. Right after he graduated, he went and joined the U.S. Army for World War II, where he was stationed on, Aleutian, on the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, like digging ice caves and keeping meteorological records that were used to dictate troop movements around the rest of the Pacific. After the war, he became a botany inspector for U.S. Customs, who now knows more about ferns than anyone I have ever met. He um, became a statistician for the IRS, that's the tax collecting agency in the United States, and published a number of papers on overlapping statistical collections that changed the way the U.S. Census now conducts its research. And in his retirement, he started writing poetry based on passages from the Bible. He now writes music that poetry can be performed by voice, piano, and banjo. And he's been invited by African-American gospel choirs to sing in their churches, even though my family is Jewish. <laughs> Jewish? Oh, my family is Jewish. Oh. <laughs> my grandpa's better than yours. Really? Yeah. Do you want to make an argument, or you just yeah, want to like sure. leave it at that? No, no, okay. my grandpa's better than yours. Okay, so first of all, he's not boring with all that economic stuff. And, um, <laughs> Whoa. And second of all, <laughs> second of all, he charged my aunt, so his daughter, for rent after she dropped out of college, so that he could teach her how to make a better living for herself. And my dad wanted to borrow money for his car. He made he charged interest so that he could learn how things work in the real world. So, all right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so here's the obvious follow-up question. What did you learn about me? What did you learn about Leanne? Nothing. You didn't even really learn if I'm Jewish or not. You learned my family's Jewish. Maybe that means I'm Jewish. Maybe it doesn't. But you learned nothing about me. Which is obvious to the point where it's like, why am I even talking about something so clear? Right? Well, you wrote an essay and it's not about you. That's bad. I didn't need to do the whole thing for that. But the truth is that a lot of the questions you're going to be asked to answer set you up to make this mistake. They ask questions like, describe blank and its influence on you. Describe a person and its influence on you, an event and its influence on you, a work of art and its influence on you. Describe a time that you face a difficulty and how that difficulty changed the way you see yourself. Like, you know, these kinds of questions that say, describe something and how that something influenced you. And if you got that essay in a history classroom, right, if your history teacher said, I want you to write an essay on how the Sino-Russian War changed um, Russian outlook towards its neighbors in Asia. You would have to do something very specific. You'd write an introductory paragraph, you know, with an upside-down pyramid, right, and a thesis at the bottom. 
you have body paragraph number one about the outbreak of the war, body paragraph number two, or body paragraph number one on the outbreak of the war and why the war broke out, right? Body paragraph number two on the events that transpired in the war, body paragraph number three on the legacy of those events that transpired in the war, and, body, and then the concluding paragraph where you desperately try to find a way to restate your thesis without all of you doing is restating your thesis, right? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? <laughs> How many of those paragraphs are actually about the impact of the Sino-Russian war on its role of, on Russia's role with its neighbors in Asia now? One paragraph. Five paragraph essay, one paragraph is actually about the impact. And everything else is proving to your history teacher that you know enough about the Sino-Russian war to be able to write the impact in the first place. Because that's the point of the essay. It's not actually to like come up with an interesting idea for the impact, although you know your teachers will tell you that. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. Though. Um, <laughs> the point of the essay is, to, is so that you have an opportunity to prove that you're reading the book a little bit. <laughs> How many of you love your family? You love your family. Raise your hands. Even if you love them begrudgingly, <laughs> begrudgingly your hand goes up a little bit more. <laughs> um, How many of you would say you have been influenced by your family? You've been influenced by your family. Raise your hand. Oh my God, all of you. I'm so surprised, though. Not Kathy. Oh, I am. Inter yeah. Miss <laughs> um, Curtis. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, of course you've been influenced by your family. We're all influenced by our family. We're all influenced by everything. We are human beings. What it means to be human is to be influenced by everything around us all the time. I'm a, a little bit of a large Star Trek nerd, and um, I, I really like uh, the Next Generation because of the, mostly because of the one, like Lieutenant Commander Data is like my favorite character, and he's, a, he's an android, and he's described in the show as being a heuristic artificial life form, and I love the word heuristic. It basically means that you learn from the events as they transpire around us, and we are all heuristic. That's in fact what it means to be human, and in fact the, the moral and ethical and kind of philosophic dilemma of Data the android is that by being heuristic, he is in fact human, right? You don't care. It's okay. Um, look, you are influenced by everything all the time. What is interesting to me is not what your influences are, because your influences are everything. What's interesting to me is who are you now, and how do you see yourself or the world or the ideas around you now as a result of those influences. I don't need you to prove to me that you know who your grandfather is. I will believe you. I don't need to prove to me that you love your grandfather. If you tell me he's important to you, I will believe you. I don't need you to prove to me that he's been an influence on you. If you tell me he is, I will believe you. What I need you to show me is how do you see the world differently because of the role that person played? How have your goals for the future evolved as a result of the moment that you experienced that changed your life forever? If you're writing not just about your grandparents, I mean, you could be writing about community service or service trips that you take. I mean, I know you guys do a lot of different service trips around the world and in different places. And if you were going to write your essay about your community service and how important it is, you need to have something deeper to say than service is important or it's amazing that poor people can be happy too. <laughs> you laugh, but that is the vast majority of the service trip essays we get. And I think we get those essays because you are telling us what you think you are supposed to say which is, I'm supposed to write about service. Not because you're writing about the things that really matter to you. And the next essay I want to talk about um, are essays about athletics. Are any of you athletes? Athletes, your hands. Are any of you runners? Runners would be great. One of you is a runner. Cross country or track? Track. Track, okay. Well, I'm going to do a cross country run because track terrifies me. <laughs> okay, and what I'm going to do is a uh, a slight exaggeration of the average track or the average cross country essay. When I'm done, I want you to tell me what you think you learned about me as a thinker or as an intellectual as a result of this. Okay? Are you ready? Sure. Okay. I was not ready for the big race though, because I was nervous about it and I had been told that this course had a lot of hills on it, and where I train, we don't have hills. But we started running the race, and I was feeling really good about myself. Not because I was at the front of the pack, I wasn't, but I wasn't at the back of the pack where I expected to be. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we started climbing the first hill. Oh my god, hills are really hard. I got up the first hill, and I was out of breath, and I thought, I don't, know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it up a second hill. And then I went up the second hill, and I got halfway up the second hill, I thought, I'm not going to make it. And then I did make it, and I thought, maybe I can make it up the third. And then I made it up the third, and then the fourth, and then I finished the race. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually how cross country runners finish races. <laughs> um, and that. That is how I learned that if you don't give up, anything is possible. <laughs> so what did you learn about me? Okay, you are very 
cliche writer. <laughs> Julian, what do you think about me? What quality comes through from that essay? Perseverance. Yeah. Perseverance. That's a great word. I like that. Perseverance comes through. And I don't want to pick on the athletes, right? Although there are a lot of athletes that write these essays that are about perseverance. Because there are also, um, there's also the big Bach concerto where you're playing a hard violin piece, you don't know if you can get it right, and then you do. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> or there's the theater essay. Um, Everything's going wrong behind the scenes, and then the curtain goes up and things work out. Or there's the you know model you enter debate essay where you're going up against the undefeated team, you've worked really hard, you try, and somehow you manage to unseat them. Or maybe you don't unseat them, but you work really hard and that's valuable too. Maybe you're running that race and instead of actually finishing, you trip and fall halfway up that first hill and you break your leg. But you get up and you continue to run anyway with a shard of bone sticking out of your thigh, and you are now doing permanent physical damage to yourself. You will not get off the course until people drag you off because you persevered. And the moral of these essays is always the same. Perseverance, drive, determination, commitment, resolve, passion. Interchangeable words that all mean hard work. And that is a waste of my time and a waste of your time to write an essay about how hard you work. What's the first thing I look at in your application? You remember what I told you the first thing was? Four grades. Say it loud. Rigor. What are you taking in your classes? Then I look at your grades. And if you're doing well in the IB curriculum, I think you know how to work hard. I don't know if you've heard this about the IB. The IB is difficult. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's like a, collection, a, collection, a mixture of um, both relief that I know that on your faces, and also like, oh, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> um, I mean, if I can look at nothing but your numbers, seriously, I can look at nothing but your numbers and I will see whether or not you work hard. That doesn't tell me whether you're inductive or deductive or creative or logical or cynical or optimistic. You know, it doesn't tell me any of the things that are actually substantive about who you are. And I know that hard work is important, like it's a valuable quality, but if you don't have hard work, you've already been stripped out of the pool. You're done. You work hard or I wouldn't be reading your essays. And hard work does not define you. You define the work. You don't run track and then have track define you. You run track because something in you draws you to track. <laughs> or it doesn't. <laughs> in which case, find something else to do. <laughs> like, for the two of you that giggled when I started talking about theater, you didn't know I could see that. <laughs> like, you don't get defined by theater. Instead, you define why you do theater. You are doing the things you are doing because of who you are, not the other way around. And so you need to be able to take a critical look at the things that you do with your time and to be able to say, why am I doing any of this at all? What is it about me that's, having, like, that's pushing me to these things? And what am I learning by doing these things, both about myself and about the world and about the interests and about the things I want to think about and do? The how and the why are so much more interesting than the what. And an essay that talks about hard work is an essay about the what. How many of you are like freaked out right now? Just like freaking out a little bit. You're like, oh my god, these are all the ideas I was going to talk about. In my <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch of totally new things to do. Um, yeah, I get that. I respect that. Um, and this is really hard because you know the cliche that admissions officers have. I'm going to tell you like what you should do now. And um, the cliche is like admissions officers will sit at the front of the room and they'll talk about the essays. And if you visited schools in the United States, doubtless you've heard this. They'll say, "Tell us who you are." <laughs> Right? Your voices always get slightly higher pitched. <laughs> we want to know about you. Who are you? What are you going to bring to our campus? Um, and this should make you roll your eyes. I mean, it makes me roll my eyes. I'm a, I'm a deeply cynical person. I don't know if that's come through yet. Um, uh, and I always think, like, what are they supposed to do? Are they going to get up at the front of the room and be like, listen. <laughs> if you aren't cool enough to get in here, lie to me. Fake it. If you think your older brother is the smarter, more interesting version of you, pretend to be him. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> on Sunday I was doing a presentation like this in, uh, in Nanjing, and I said that to a group of Chinese students, and then the thought flashed in my head, oh my god, they don't have siblings. <laughs> <laughs> So awkward. 
Um, you know, there's like no other option. You have to tell me about yourself. But the reason that we give you that cliche, and the reason that we, we give you that like really kind of trite thing to say, tell us who you are, is because you need to be able to do that with confidence, and you have to know who you are first, right? Like they say, tell us who you are, and then they kind of they abscond. They say like, oh, but you know, like you like they just assume you already know, which is a ridiculous assumption because most of the adults who are teaching you wouldn't be able to answer the question, who are you? Like if you showed up and said, who are you? They would go. <laughs> Although my name's Dan, right? So like, I, I, you know, like, I'm Dan, like, I live here, but I grew up there, and I like, give you a biography, right? But that doesn't tell you who they are, it tells you where they've been. And so this is an incredibly difficult thing, because you have to be able to answer a question that I don't think anyone's actually asked you to answer before. You know, and it's not like people tell you to reflect on your successes, they ask you to reflect on your failures. You know, if you screw up, your parents will say, go to your room and think about what you've done. But it's not like you succeed and your parents are like, I'm so proud of you. Go to your room and think about what you've done. <laughs> but that's kind of what you have to do now over the next six months, is you have to be able to take some time and figure those things out so that you can then talk about them. And my advice to you for what you should talk about, um, and this is going to sound a little counterintuitive, is talk about small things. You don't have to. It's not like a rule, right? If you don't, I mean, if I read your essays and you're not talking about something small, I'm not going to deny you, right? Just for that. But my advice to you is to talk about a small thing that has big meaning to you. Find a tiny event or a tiny idea or a tiny experience that somehow encapsulates something big as you see it and give meaning to something small. Make me care about something I didn't know I should have cared about. And I think you do that by talking about kind of one of three broad ideas. You want to be talking about how you see yourself you want to be talking about how you see the world, or you want to be talking about how you see ideas, broadly. And you can do that you know, by using the first person, you can do that by talking about the things that are external to you, you can do that in a lot of different ways. There really aren't rules for how you have to go through and answer this, which in some ways I think is really comforting and really exciting to know that there aren't like set rigid rules, but it's also terrifying that somebody's like, do whatever you want. Um, some of you perhaps are like struggling with the college search because somebody asks you what do you want to study and the answer is everything and like that's both exciting and terrifying at the same time and that's kind of like what this is like what, do you, what am I supposed to do? Anything. <laughs> you know and that's exciting and terrifying at the same time. But I can tell you that my favorite essay of all time is an essay that a girl wrote about the difference between mechanical pencils and regular pencils. <laughs> that's it. And she said that using a mechanical pencil is like bringing a laser gun into a sword fight. Like you're going to win. But a sword has grace and elegance and history, and a laser has none of that. You win at the expense of your soul. <laughs> That's okay. um, and, uh, and I remember finishing that and thinking, who the hell thinks like this? Like, who looks at two pencils and sees the challenge between form and function in that way? Between aesthetic and efficiency? You know, like... The, what makes the iPhone so amazing, what makes it like such a beautiful piece of what it is, is not just that it works, it's that it feels good. You know? Like when you have to slide to unlock, it makes that, like, and it makes that click sound. Oh. Just like, it's satisfying. And you know why they made that click sound there? Because this was the first phone anyone was going to buy that didn't have buttons. And so if you were going to sell someone something that didn't have buttons, and everything that anyone had ever known about a phone before was all buttons, right? You had to give them an experience that was as satisfying as pushing a button when all they're doing is sliding their finger over glass. And that's what this girl was talking about by talking about pencils. Whether you care about mechanical pencils or not, don't you want to meet her? Don't you kind of want to sit down and have a conversation with her? Like figure out why she even noticed this in the first place. <laughs> My favorite essay from last year that anyone wrote was an essay that came from Thailand, and what I, what I loved about this essay in particular was, um, especially in, in Thai culture, although in, in many other cultures too, but in Thai culture there's a strong emphasis on humility. The idea of talking about yourself is like one that's really uncomfortable for a lot of students here, um, you know, of all different kind of cultural persuasions, but especially you know, people who are born and raised culturally Thai. Um, and so, you know, here we are saying, tell us about how awesome you are, right? And so for a lot of students, especially the students in Thai local schools, like, this is a horrifying thing. And so this was a girl who applied from a Thai local school, uh, who's now at Tufts, 
and she wrote this amazing essay about corruption in Thailand and how she thinks that one of the reasons that Thai politics are so corrupt is because Thailand as a society is deeply Buddhist. And Buddhism, you know, as a philosophy, teaches you to be the, you know, the boat on the wave, right? Like, you want to be mindful of where you are now. Don't worry about the wave that's coming. Don't worry about the wave that just, that's, you know, that left. Worry about where you are now. Let it go. Don't be angry. Don't hold on to resentment. Like, be. And her position, her, her belief was, how are you supposed to root out corruption if you're not allowed to be angry about it? And I don't know if she's right. I don't actually care if she's right. Whether she's correct or not, immaterial. The idea itself, you want to meet her. And she did not write this in the first person. She didn't say I anywhere. She didn't say here's what I believe, here's what I see. She just kind of wrote about Thai society as she sees it around her in a way that was totally external. But that gave me this deep insight into who she was and how she thinks. In a way that made me want to meet her. And so if you're in that boat, on the wave, <laughs> where you're thinking, I don't know how to talk about myself. Talk about what you see. And in talking about what you see, you'll show me who you are. What you notice in the world around you will reflect on who you are. And, you know, when I say write about small things, you know, the moment when you're walking around, you know, the streets of downtown Bangkok and you look up at a billboard on armpit way here, and, <laughs> and it makes you mad. And all of your friends are looking at it like, what's the big deal? We walk by billboards like this all the time. Who cares? Like, that can be an essay topic. You're, um, you're in class talking about thermodynamics and physics, and you start getting really excited about thermodynamics, and everyone else in the room looks completely bored. That can be an essay topic. You know, the things you see that your friends miss and you don't understand why they don't see what you see, the things that you get excited about that the people around you don't seem to think are cool or interesting and you don't get why, those are really powerful essay topics. The moments when you react to something totally differently from everyone around you, that can be an essay topic. And it doesn't have to be something big about community service or about, you know, wanting to come to the United States or, you know, changing the world, although those are fine things to talk about. You can write about really tiny, intimate moments and breathe meaning into them in a way that gets me excited about who you are and what you can do. Do you have questions about any of this? Um, how many essays do you have to write for the supplement? Depends on the schools you're applying to. You mean for us specifically? Um, yeah. For Tufts, there's the Common App essay, and then there are um, three required short essays. One is 50 to 100 words, one is 200 to 250 words, the other is also 200 to 250 words. You probably text more in a day than those essays actually are. <laughs> so it sounds daunting when I say three, but they're actually pretty short. Um, we write them in such a way that we hope you get to like let your hair down. And I mean, not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'll be off. Uh, um, but like you know, metaphorically, you know, uh, and you know where you can like you can open up. I mean, what I'll what I'll share with you, just kind of between us, um, is I would say that seventy percent of the applications I read, the supplemental essays are better than the common app essays because you spend so much time working on the Common App essays that you wash yourself out. Like you fret over this and over that and you try to write something that's going to please everyone and as a result you please no one or fewer people. Um, that was the case actually for a couple of applicants from ISB this year. It's the case every year for many, many students where I finish reading their Common App and I think, ah! and then I get to the supplement and I'm like, oh my god, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there's a lesson there in you can be more forward than you perhaps feel you can be, and you can take risks in a way that feel risky to you but aren't risky to us. Um, but I also think you should be applying to a set of schools that are already inclined to appreciate the risks you want to take. Like, if you're a formal person, and you write a formal essay, because formality, you know, I mean, there are schools you can apply to where everyone gets dressed up for class, and, you know, professors are addressed by servant man and things like that. And there are other schools you can go to where you can call your professors by their first name. It's not a big deal. And depending on where you want to be on that spectrum, right, you should be applying to one set of schools over another culturally. And so if you're a really informal person, and the idea of writing like, hello, like as a, a, an admit from RIS this year, who in her Why Tufts actually wrote, hello, Dan, like to me, because she knew I was going to be reading her application, um, which, like you should not all do now. <laughs> <laughs> I get like all these applications from Thailand workers like, hello Dan, I'm going to know why. Um, but, you know, like, 
she, she came up to me, at, like she came up to me when I was at RIS yesterday, she said like, yours was the only application where I felt like I could do that. And what I would say to the junior year version of her is every school you're applying to should be a school where you feel like you can do that or you have applied to the wrong set of schools. If that's what you want. You know, so like, if you're someone that really wants to talk about really risky, controversial things, apply to schools that are going to be really excited that you want to talk about risky, controversial things, and then they'll be more likely to admit you, and you'll feel better about applying. So that's what I have to say about that. Other questions? We have another handful of minutes. So my goal here, when you leave, is to, for you to feel half really excited and half totally scared. <laughs> Am I about there? Good. Because you, you should be really amped to be able to be like, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about, and I'm going to share about the things that matter to me, and I'm going to get excited about myself and ideas and the world around me, and I'm going to share that with everyone who's going to listen. And that should be awesome. And it should also be terrifying because whenever anybody asks you to like look introspectively in that way with that kind of depth, that should be a little bit scary. And a good way to tell whether or not you're doing it right is if you feel you've learned something about yourself in the process of writing your essays, that's a really good sign. If you really like what you're sending in, that's a good sign. If you wrote it and you are bored by your own ideas, that's bad. And I know that that sounds obvious, but I also know that when I was in high school, the essays I was the most excited to turn in were the ones where I tended to get the best grades. And the essays I was the most bored writing were the ones where I tended to get A's. Because the essays that I was excited to turn in were the ones where I didn't do the assignment. <laughs> and my teachers would hand it back and they would say, this was really interesting, but this is not the question I asked you to answer. Um, you know, I think you guys have some really wide latitude with how you answer the questions that we ask you. I don't think you need to worry about like what's literally being asked. I think you can have, you can look at the questions that you get asked by applications everywhere, and you can say, what's the spirit of this question, and how do I address the spirit of it? And that's okay. Um, and so you know, you want to be able to finish your writing and look back at what you've written and go like, I am genuinely excited about what I put down on paper here. And you don't have to be a good writer to do that. I was a really mediocre writer in high school, and I don't know if I actually did that in my application, but I've read essays that are written by really mediocre writers that I still love because what they're talking about is cool. Okay, thanks for coming, guys. It's 3 o'clock. I really appreciate it. I hope this was helpful.